Good morning, sisters and brothers. Let's do our uh, standard weekly test of the emergency joy system known as your horn. That means you hear me. That is fantastic. Welcome to worship this morning. It is an honor and a pleasure to be able to worship our God again and to follow in the faith and the history of so many of our predecessors who have shown that worship is not limited to one way, but is expansive and open to all. So let's take this moment uh, here at the beginning and go over some announcements that you might see or be interested in. Uh, our Bible study is uh, still continuing on Tuesday, more, Tuesday afternoons from 1.30 to 2.30, and we do that via Zoom. If you are interested in joining, please do contact me. We've worked really hard to uh, make it a space that uh, is one that you could drop into, um, as well as follow along at the same time. So if you've missed a week and you're like, well, I, I can't join in or all oh, they've been doing it for a couple of weeks. I don't want to, you know, mess up. You won't. Please do come and join us. We would love to have you. Uh, we're, our Wednesday evening get together still continue. Those are Wednesday nights at seven o'clock. Um, and of course, those happen via Zoom as well, too. And uh, those are just actually super silly times. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we spend more time laughing than we do actually talking. Um, and so we would like to invite you to come and be part of that as well, too. Um, the, uh, uh, the offering and tithes um, can still be mailed to our church. So if you do want to uh, send in an offering, you can do that. If you weren't able to bring it here today, that's fine. You can send it uh, or drop it off when Carrie's here. And she's here Monday through Fridays, 9, to two, 9 in the morning, so 12 in the afternoon. A uh, lot of information continues to go out via our uh, one call system. So if you haven't received a one call devotion throughout the week for one reason or another, uh, we probably need to get your number updated. Uh, so please do let us know, let Carrie know as well too. Um, also, if uh, you accidentally get a bunch of calls from us in one day, one call had a bit of a glitch there. So uh, don't worry, it's not just you. Uh, and uh, they they think they've corrected the problem, and uh, so far I haven't heard of any issues since then. Our directory for 2021 is available. Uh, it is an orange dire orange cover directory. If you've not received it yet, let us know. We have some available we can give you. Uh, if you need one to be mailed to you, please let us know. We'll do that as well, too. Sue Wampler continues to take items to St. Vincent de Paul as well as the uh, food pantry uh, as well. And you can see the needs that are there, are listed, are, are kind of ex expected at this point. For St. Vincent, um, any clothes, uh, especially warm weather clothes, coats, hats, gloves, mittens, uh, hot, you know, thermal socks, things that, that uh, are robust and can be used again and again. For the soup kitchen, uh, I'm sorry, not for the soup kitchen, for the food pantry, uh, things such as shelf-stable products, um, so uh, canned goods, um, uh, you'll see that list there, chili, cereal, oatmeal, pancake mix, syrup, evaporated milk, things that, that, that shelves um, yeah, are on most of our shelves and have been for some time. You also see some updates that are in there as well, too. Um, there's an update for an email address and a phone number, um, so please do check those. And there are uh, also continuing prayers that our, our church is aware of that are listed here as well, too. Those are our announcements. That's a way that we use to start our time here this morning. Not as a way of saying this is all that's going on, but highlighting some of the things that are going on. When it comes to being God's people, it's a matter of finding ways that you can engage in worship. Finding ways that you can engage in service finding ways that you can engage in the radical hospitality of God. I invite you now to do that in this space. Let us join together with the call to worship, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. God, we are, a, we are worried about people, forgotten people, and people without parents. Prisoners of wars, both external and internal. Those who can't work but want to those who are homeless, those who are hungry, those who are cold. Those who struggle, who feel alone, and who yearn for peace. Lord, as we have come to worship you, may we follow your call. May we use the gifts that you have provided each of us to show your care. May your love be known through us, God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come to this time of worship 
seeking to understand. Help us understand why so much in this world seems out of control, beyond our control, and seemingly nonsensical. We are created in your image, and you know all things. So we want to know, and we want to understand. Help us to understand what we are to do, how we are to be, and how we are to show your peace in this world. There is an abundance of hate, anger, and fear, and we know that you call for love, grace, and peace. Lord, help us to follow your call. Amen. Our first song this morning is Gentle Shepherd. invite Pastor Lee to come up. You can have your coffee in a minute while I'm finishing. I have three objects here. Mm -hmm. I have an old shoe. Mm -hmm. I have a little wagon. And I have Karen Dillon. Now, tell me, how are these three things alike? Um, they have specific purposes that work really well in their particular settings. 
close. I'm not going to say the letters O-L-D. Don't, don't. That they're old. I'm not saying it. You said old shoe and then old wagon. And old lady. No, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> okay. There's something about these three things. They came from your house? They came from my house. That's true. That's not what I'm thinking of. Okay. I, I thought you would get it right away. Oh, you have way too much faith in me. Because this, this story comes from, uh, sprang to my mind while we were doing our Bible study on Tuesday, which was about tongues. Oh. My shoe <laughs> has a tongue. Ah, okay. My little wagon has a tongue, <laughs> and I have a tongue, and all of you have tongues. That's what it's about. So this children's story or message is about tongues. Now, down you may sit down and drink your coffee, Lee. <laughs> tongues are really important in our lives. We sometimes take them for granted. And um, as I was reading about the structure of the tongues, I noticed that um, it said that people don't even take care of their tongues because uh, when you brush your teeth, you're really supposed to brush your tongue because it needs care just like everything else. Did you know that the tongue is made up mostly of eight muscles? Now, even though the tongue is strong, it's not the strongest muscle in the body, but it is a set of muscles that never get tired. You never get a cramp in your tongue, do you? I've never had one. I've never even heard of one. And your tongue never tires so that even in the middle of the night or all during the day, your tongue is at work, but it never gets tired. And it does a lot of things. Of course, it helps us talk and it helps us express ourselves. And also, it helps us eat and it moves food around in our mouth in the right way occasionally we accidentally bite our tongue and, oh, does that hurt? And you think, why did I do that? Our tongues are really important to us. Now, when I was a little girl and if I was caught sticking my tongue out, I would get in lots of trouble because in our culture, sticking your tongue out is forbidden and you're not to do it and it was a sign of being nasty. However, in some cultures, it's not the same. There are cultures where if you stick out your tongue, it's a greeting. But then there are other cultures that if you stick your tongue out, it's a sign that you want to go to war. And if a woman would stick out her tongue in some cultures, it was showing defiance to the people around her. I don't know if the man stuck his tongue out, if they said the same thing, but it was an act of defiance. So we have our tongues and we use them for lots of things. And do you know that even Jesus talked about the tongue? He said that... The tongue is an expression of what's inside. Hmm. That gives us food for thought, doesn't it? What we put in our bodies sometimes comes out with our tongue. What we think in our heads sometimes comes out with our mouth and what we say. Now, doctors use your tongue a lot of times. Did you ever hear them say, stick out your tongue? At the doctor's office, they put a tongue depressor on it and they use that. They are also looking at your tongue because if your tongue is discolored or has a, a white film on it, that there, there are signs from your tongue that something's not right inside. Too bad our words aren't color-coded like that. Christ was telling us that we need to be careful what our tongue says. Even in James, it talks about the tongue. It says that, all kinds of animals and birds have been tamed by humans, but no one can tame the tongue. We can say, come to church and worship and praise God. And God is so happy to hear that. But at other times when we're angry with one another or if we're disgusted or we're upset, what comes out with our tongue is not pleasant. Sometimes it's even cursing. Sometimes it's wishing things that would be evil. We have to work at taking care of our tongue. We have to make sure that things that we think we should say when we're in a moment of anger or being highly upset or frustrated, we should stop and think. Jesus says that what comes out of our mouth is a sign of what's inside of us. And if evil is coming out of our mouth, evil is inside of us. So we have to work at not saying mean things. And sometimes that's very hard to do. I grew up with three brothers. And for some reason, it was always three to one. Those three brothers of different ages, one older, two younger, 
always stood together against me, the one. Three to one. I never thought that was fair. Um, sometimes I would say mean things to them. And then, as an adult, I regret some of the things I said. It was growing up. And, and forgiveness is hard when uh, it's your family. But mean things came out of my mouth. That meant that there were mean things inside of me. And as I grew up, I worked to get rid of those. And how did I get rid of those? I kept going back to scriptures. I kept going back, coming to church, and going to God in prayer, asking him, Lord, give me the strength and the courage to stop being mean. Help me to not harbor mean things inside of me. Help me get rid of those feelings and replace them with love. Part of the scriptures in James will tell you a whole lot more about the tongue. But I want to read you one of these thing, uh, what, a couple of the verses. This is found in James 3, and it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we can also curse other people who have been made in God's own image. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt, salt spring produce fresh water. Our mouths are part of God's image. What we, what we say and what we do with our mouths, we should do to praise God and to be uplifting and supportive and loving to the people around us. We can't have two things coming out at the same time, so let's choose to do the praise of God. As we praise God together and as we remember scriptures and put them in our heart, we will erase and get rid of the anger, the meanness, the frustrations, the things that make us pull down and look on the evil side. We want to look on the bright side. We want to be on God's side. We want to follow what Christ Jesus has taught us in so many ways. So, think about it. Tongues are important to us. They keep us healthy. They help us eat. They help us talk, communicate with other people but they also allow us to praise God. Let us praise God in all we do because you know God loves you. I love you too. Can you hear me? If so, please honk your horn. Okay, well that was... We don't know what that was. Uh, apparently some gremlins got into the computer system and said, meh. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, and we will work to figure out what caused that so it does not happen again. But if it does, it's a good thing we're a people of grace. Thank you, Karen, for that children's story. And thank you all for your patience as we work to do some on-the-spot troubleshooting there. This time of offering is one of the aspects of worship that is consistent throughout all of history of God and God's people. Why? Why is there a constant and steady call to have an offering to God? Does God need the money? No. What God asks is not for us to make a God of the money, but to allow God to use us. What God asks is that for those who have whatever that they may have, that the focus not be on the fact that they have. I know that sounded weird, but it's giving. Because giving is what God does. God gave freely and then asks for his people to do the same. When God calls for God's people in all times and in all ages to give offering, God is reminding the people that they were made in the image of God, that they are called to show God's love before anything else and to give that love as freely as God has. So let us approach this time of offering with love at our core. Let us pray. Lord, we present this offering and recall that we are called to show your love in this world, just as you have shown love to us. This offering, this money, is not, not the only gift that we have. 
money has the deep temptation to be hoarded and used as a tool of control. When we present this tool to you, we are rejecting the control of the world and claiming your gift, your giving love, and its abundant ways that we only ever partly understand. Lord, use this offering as you would use us in any way that you see fit. In your name we pray. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Our scripture for today comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 and 10. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. As we get ready to continue in our worship, as we let me rephrase that, as we continue in our worship, uh, one of the things that we've been doing during our time of parking lot worship and online worship 
is exploring different um, contemporary songs as well, too. Uh, and this is another one that we're going to play here, and it's Matt Mayer's uh, All the People Said Amen. And uh, I, I encourage you that if you hear a song throughout your week that you think uh, really resonates with something or would be, be beneficial maybe to share, let me know. I'd be happy to share that with our community as well, too. For now, let us continue in our worship with, our, with a special gift. The, let's do a quick test. If you can hear me, honk your horns. Goody. I say that because the audio has been tons of fun today. Um, I say tons of fun because it hasn't. Uh, at, at one point, um, the <laughs> audio cut out for the internet, and we got that fixed, and then it cut out for you. So it was like, this is dynamic. And it's interesting, because in the midst of those moments... As much as, as I work hard and others work hard to try to fashion these worship services to be a very specific thing, we're reminded that worship continues not because of what we say, but because of what we do. So whenever we show grace, whenever we show patience with one another, whenever we're able to giggle through some of the silly things knowing that we can figure it out, that bears tremendous power for what God desires of God's people. As we come to the end of our uh, series on hospitality, my hope is that you've had a spark of faithful curiosity and wonderment as to how you might be able to live out the radical hospitality of God. At the beginning of this series, I defined radical hospitality as the work and actions of treating strangers as friends, 
friends as honored, and serving them all in any way that we can. We've talked about hospitality being responsive by looking at God knocking at our door and asking to be let in and change the hearts of those who God enters into. The idea being that the change that God would cause within the person would be one of love and one that would reflect God's love. This idea was talked about again in our second week when the act of foot washing was used as the example of God's love of what it, is look, what it looks like to be lived out among God's people. The, the idea and the image of Jesus kneeling to wash the feet of the ones who would abandon him, the ones who would deny him, the ones who would betray him, the ones who frustrated him, the ones who drove him kind of nuts, the ones who heard him and missed the point time and time again. They were ones that he argued with, but he also empowered. He also cautioned. He also supported. He challenged and he cared for. Jesus, being God on earth, had the power and the ability to use force and might and power, the likes of which had never been seen, and instead chose to create a new way of doing life and use the power of service as the way to show that power and love can work together and do truly amazing things. We then discussed last week that being a sheeple for God is indeed a very good thing. And it is something that is seen uh, as confusing to the world. Scripture would go so far as to call it foolish in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But this foolishness of radical hospitality is the very thing that God showed, the very thing that God yearned for, the very thing that God desires for God's creation. Over and over again, the idea of radical hospitality is both rooted in and is a vibrant display of the love of God. I want to reread our scripture this morning. Verse 8, Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Now, it is here that I want to talk about something interesting. Boundaries. Boundaries are the identity markers that define who and what a person or a people are. Boundaries are used all the time. Boundaries are, at the best of times, well-defined and used to help move the world along. At the worst of time, boundaries are violated and truly terrible things occur. So why am I talking about boundaries when we've talked about hospitality so much? Why would I bring up the idea of a, a barrier when I've talked so much about being open before? Well, let me start to tell you why by telling you a story. I want to introduce you to Heinz. Now, Heinz is part beagle, part dachshund, and all puppy. At least he was about 16 years ago. Heinz was a last-minute addition to the package deal of my sister, Corey, coming to live with me. When I say last minute, I mean like literally two days before she moved back from North Carolina to Pennsylvania to live with me. She calls me and tells me she found a doggy. And she shares the story of how she found this little dog. And it wasn't very a great situation. Well... I'm a sucker for animals, as much as my cats drive me nuts. I love animals. And so, the story of Heinz was rather heartbreaking, and so without much hesitation, I said sure. And I would notify our landlord and put down the additional deposit that would be necessary for having a pet. A few days later, there was my sister with this little puppy. And two things you were very quickly observable with this little dog. Before my, my sister found him, this puppy probably would not have been long for the world. And the second thing was, this puppy had way more energy than any puppy should be allowed to have. If, if, uh, for those of you who have seen Isaac at Isaac's best, um, imagine all that energy placed into a small dog about this big. There you go. Beat Heinz. As my sister and Heinz adjusted to living with me and I with them, we took a couple of days for just the, the, the now three of us to hang out and get comfortable with one another. 
we took this opportunity for my sister to to kind of get acclimated to the area uh for for uh, myself to adjust to living with her um for the record i i know there's a few things i never did fully adjust to one of them was leaving a can of soda half empty on the floor um and then inevitably as i would trundle through the house not quite aware of what's going on i'd inevitably kick it but that's neither here nor there uh, I say that because I know she's watching this right now, and so she can't argue because I'm online, and she's not. We knew the time would come, though, as we got uh, used to one another about uh, learning um, how to live with one another again, that there would come a time where we had to go to work. We had to separate for a little bit. We had to go do our own thing. And so we used those times as well, too, to kind of train Heinz. So we would uh, go out of the apartment, just Corey and I, go somewhere, come back, to, and had a treat ready for him to, to remind him and reassure him, hey, we come back, and we're always going to come back, and it's all good. We felt pretty confident that uh, Heinz would do fine when we'd have to go to work. The system we'd worked out was my sister would come home during her lunch break and let him out and do whatever every life form has to do. Um, when I would get home a couple of hours after she did, I would take him outside and, again, let him do what every life form has to do. And then I'd be home with him, you know, until Corey got home and, you know, we did whatever we did. That was a good plan. It was well thought out. That plan didn't work at all. It, it, it rarely worked. In fact, I don't think it worked at all. The first day, my sister sent me a text saying that when she went home, Heinz had had an accident on the floor. She cleaned it up and it was fine. Now, that was to be expected. He's a puppy. He was alone by himself. That no, no worries. I realized, though, that I hadn't bought puppy pads. You know, anybody who's had a puppy knows that you got to buy those things. So I stopped on the way home. However, somewhere between the time that my sister Corey left and I got home, Heinz had been possessed by the spirit of a honey badger because he had destroyed everything in the house. He had flipped over his food dish, his water dish. He had drug out my sister's clothes from her room and they were strewn about the apartment. And that really comfy puppy bed we had bought him. We had bought him one early. That really wonderful thing that we thought, oh, he would just nestle in. It'd be wonderful. What we learned really quick was we discovered what made us so comfortable. How do we discover it? Because Heinz had ripped that open and strewn the parts everywhere. Whee! It was a shower of softness. Oh, one more thing. He left what I called protest piles. Uh, throughout the apartment. Now, um, what I mean by protest piles, I'm not going to get too graphic, but basically um, he was angry with what we did, and so he was more than happy to display uh, his brown anger wherever he could. And right now I know my wife's going to yell at me for saying that, but I'm going to roll with it. And this became the routine, actually, for about a week. That was the routine. The plan that we had, Heinz destroyed. Heinz would have no part of this. Finally, we did something we were hoping not to do. We got a kennel for him to stay in while we were away. We didn't want him to feel crated or boarded up. We didn't want him to feel uh, as though he was a prisoner. But ironically, that seemed to do the trick. Whenever Heinz had a boundary, had a barrier, had a place to be, he felt protected. It seemed that he knew then that those who loved him would always come back and always be there for him. But when they were away, he was protected. He wasn't forced to change. He was just himself. Now, I, I would love to be able to say that there were never any other issues with protest piles. That wasn't the case. Sometimes there were still some, but not nearly as many. I would like to say that we got him another new comfy bed and that he we put it in that little kennel for him and he loved it. I can't. He tore that one apart too. We put some towels in there. That seemed to do the trick. When I think about hospitality, I actually think about that dog a lot. See, my sister and I made the mistake of assuming we knew what was best for him. We were smitten with the idea of having everything be a nice, comfy setting for him, where he could lounge where he wanted, as he wanted. I think, in short, we confused Heinz for a cat. We hadn't considered that his existence prior to my sister might not incline him to live the way we wanted him to. 
We hadn't considered that whatever rough life Hines had felt, had experienced before my sister found him, might have made being alone feel too much, might have felt overwhelming. The boundaries of the K, the kennel, were not a prison. They allowed him to feel safe in his environment. When there are boundaries and a new life is welcomed in, the boundaries are not meant to keep that new life out and away, but they become the guides by which we make new life feel safe within the boundaries. Think of it this way. It's a picture frame. I have come, become increasingly certain in life that artists, artists love to have boundaries, love to have some borders. Why? Because then they know what to push up against. They know where to ask, can we push past here? They know where there's an ending. They know that they work in this area, this, this canvas, or they work with this piece of rock, this piece of clay, and it allows them to form something. Hospitality is, in effect, then, an art. It allows the people to find where it is they can grow. What are some of the boundaries that need to be pushed a little bit? What are some ways they need to grow past what is there? But these boundaries are not meant to be walls. These boundaries are not meant to keep people out, but to allow people to be protected within as well, too. And they're meant to be open, to, to allow people to come in and to be whoever they are created to be. Again, as I said, I think part of the struggle that we had with Heinz was we thought he was going to be like a cat, and he definitely wasn't. Cats can have an entire house to themselves, and they're fine. Puppies, not so much. Whenever we look at the radical hospitality of God, I think of that dog. I think of that little puppy who grew and grew, who sometimes drove us nuts. My wife has wonderful stories about when she would come visit. She was then my girlfriend, obviously. Um, uh, Heinz thought that her shirts were just the tastiest shirts in the world. Um, and he chewed more than a few holes into them. Um, she can tell stories. I would love to say that, you know, he never had any other accidents again. That wasn't the case. But what I can tell you with absolute certainty is that dog was loved. Love covers a multitude of things. That's what happens with hospitality. It, it It's not that... You expect whatever life form that comes into your house to be molded into the way that you want them to be, but you allow that life form to be molded into whatever it's going to be. So think of it this way, sisters and brothers. We are a church. And we started this series because of a question that our church participated in a survey, and it talked about, are we a welcoming people? And we had two very different answers, and they were very high answers. The first answer we gave was we felt that we were a welcoming community. But the second one was we also felt that if people didn't follow the standards of our community, they would feel unwelcomed. It's hard to, you can't really be both of those. I wonder if the question is then to consider what does radical hospitality mean for Salem Church of the Brethren? What does it mean to treat strangers as friends, friends as honored, and to serve them all in all that we are and all that we do? For as quick as we are to, to want to define what we are, we have to remember that before we are anything, we are God's people. And God calls us to live a certain way. What's that certain way? A way that bears love, that shows grace and shows humility and service. That's what we've been talking about for these past four weeks, is showing that the radical hospitality of God is not about giving somebody a cup of coffee as soon as they enter, which, but that's a good idea, by the way. It's not about giving them a donut as soon as they enter. That's also a good idea. But it's also about allowing them to come and to be 
who they are to if they come and they don't you know they're they're wearing dirty clothes who cares if they come in and, and and they're somebody who has a very different political affiliation than you who cares if there's somebody who comes and they're living a lifestyle you may not agree with or understand who cares they're here to worship god and part of the boundaries of our salem community is not about forcing people to be something other than what god created them to be and to protect them so they can do it Will there be struggles? Yes. Will there be protest piles? Oh, maybe. Will, will there be times that dirty laundry is drug out? That's possible. But whenever we practice the radical hospitality of God, something truly profound happens. You learn to love. You learn to love a life form that you never thought you could. Hines has since passed away. And I will tell you, I miss that dog. He was an ornery, squirrely little dog. But I loved him. He drove me nuts. But I loved him. That's what hospitality does. It creates love. That's the final point I want to make for the sermon series about hospitality. But it's not the final point on hospitality in and of itself. God's hospitality, the act of treating strangers as friends, friends as honored, and serving them all and all that we are and all that we do, is an act that just creates love again and again. And why do I harp on this? Because frankly, folks, look around this world. We need to show more love. We need to see our boundaries not as things that keep people out, but as places that protect so that others may come in and be who God created them to be. When we started the sermon series, it was with the information from our survey that I just spoke of here a few minutes ago. So maybe I think the better goal for us from that survey is to not see our boundaries as standards that we are to keep and that if people violate them, they're found to be unwelcome. Maybe instead, we can see our community norms as ways of holding people together. No matter who they are, where they are, when they are. And showing that even if we don't agree with them, we still love them. Even if we passionately are opposed to them, we will kneel and wash their feet. Maybe. We need to show them hospitality. But maybe we need to show it to ourselves first. To show it to one another. Do you want to know what that's called? It's called God's grace. And that is what we should strive for. Amen. So hold the prayers of one another without hesitation. Hold the prayers of one another with authenticity. Hold the worries of one another with the fierceness that you would want from those who love you to do. Hold the joys of one another with the enthusiasm you would want those who love you to do. In all that you are and in all that you do, whether you are asking for prayer or holding others for prayer, do so knowing that the hospitality of God, the love of God, is the grace of God in these moments. So come, let us meet our God with our joys and our concerns. Let us pray. God, we seek to be your people. It's not an easy destination, though. There is much along the way to throw us off where we could become very angry confused, hurt. There are pains that we suffer, physical and emotional. There are worries that overwhelm us, both uh, realistic and perhaps unrealistic, but they feel so strong. We recognize 
that fear has been used against us to motivate us for the powers of others. Help us to not be that. Help us to not be used by others, but to serve others. And to do it joyfully. To celebrate our healings, to celebrate our, our celebrations, to bring joy in our lives in ways that makes it undeniable that we know your peace, O oh God. Hear the joys and concerns of our hearts, the hopes, the hurts, the wonders, the worries, the celebrations, and the tears. In all ways, God, we desire to be your people. We desire to show your hospitality, to live the life of prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final song today is For Christ and the Church.
So go, sisters and brothers, and be love. Be radical in your hospitality. Do not allow the boundaries of life to block your ability to show God's grace, God's love, and God's peace. It will not be easy. Life never is. But we, if we can do as God has done to us, then God's peace will reign. So go now and welcome the stranger as a friend. Go now and welcome the friend and make them feel honored. Go now and serve them in all that you are and all that you do. Go now and be peace. Amen. Thank you again for your patience and your grace, sisters and brothers. Have a blessed day.